Hi, everyone. I'm Iris Reiver. I'm from the University of Antwerp. And um, I will be presenting module 1A uh, of the ESO course, which is entitled Media and Live Events Accessibility. Um, module 1A um, is one of the three foundational components of the ESO course, um, as presented here on the slide in a graph uh, that you might recognize from a previous presentation. Um, module 1A is dedicated to media and live events accessibility and amounts to one ECTS credit, which means that a student, um, that it will take a student approximately 25 to 30 hours to study the materials of this module. Um, module 1A was created by the UN team, um, which has been presented previously. So Isabel, Robert, uh, Aline Ramal, Viola Haverhals, Anthony van Huy, and myself. Um, what is the aim of module 1A? Um, it provides a general introduction to media and live events accessibility, uh, so that trainees have a general background in accessibility before being trained in the access service that is interlingual subtitling, live subtitling. And so to achieve this goal, um, the trainee will be introduced to a number of central concepts uh, that are related to uh, accessibility and which are mentioned here on the slide. So human diversity, disability, accessibility, uh, inclusion, live events accessibility, media accessibility and access services. Um, Module 1A is structured around four units. You can see them here on the slides, and you might recognize the concepts that I've just mentioned in the previous slide. So it's really centered around those central con concepts of accessibility. Um, to give you an idea of what we're teaching the students in this unit, I will go over the learning outcomes uh, of these four units. Um, and as you will see in the upcoming uh, slides, module 1A is primarily focused on the cognitive domain, on the acquisition of knowledge uh, and on comprehension. So let's start with unit one, which is entitled Human Diversity and Disability. And at the end of this unit, students should be able to explain what human diversity is and how it has evolved over time and what the social and contextual implications of human diversity are. Um, students should also be able to explain the notion of disability and uh, this means that they can describe the different disability uh, models, such as the medical model, such as the social model, and also the language that is used in these models. Um, in addition, students should be able to enumerate the different target audiences or users that might ask for uh, access support. So you could, for example, people with sensory impairments, with physical impairments, and or with mental and intellectual impairments. And they should also know the different types of access support um, that can be provided to these target audiences based on their needs. Um, then, if we move to Unit 2, which is called Accessibility and Inclusion, um, it is important that students are able to define what accessibility is and also what inclusion is. And to achieve this goal, uh, we will introduce them to the general idea of um, universal design and design for all, uh, which are really premises that underlie the idea of inclusion. Um, Students should also be able to uh, describe the various types of legislation, so uh, in international, European, national and regional um, legislation on inclusion and accessibility and how it can be um, applied to media and live events. So to give you specific examples of content of this unit, uh, for example, um, the European Accessibility Act, the United Nations Convention on, on the rights of pe persons with disabilities. Uh, so these are specific uh, examples of, of legislation. 
The third and fourth, out, a fourth outcome of this unit are related in the sense that students should be able to discuss accessibility both in relation to human rights and to accessibility studies. So what should they be able to do? For example, they should be able to describe um, the shifts in the cast in approaches to uh, accessibility that have occurred over the course of time. And they will also have to know the various stances on the position of accessibility studies. For example, in relation to audiovisual translation or to media accessibility. Um, so that's all for unit two. Um, if we then move to unit three, which is called live events accessibility, um, what kind of knowledge should students have after um, reading and, and uh, visiting the materials of this unit, they will be able to describe the principles of indoor and outdoor accessible venue requirements. For example, they should know that venue, venue should be easy to reach, to access, to use, to understand. And they should, should also be familiar with the FFZ principles. Um, moreover, they should be able to enumerate the principles that are used to, to, to assess, to evaluate the accessibility of a venue, be it indoor or be it outdoor. It might strike you as a bit odd why trainees of interlingual live subtitling are required to know these things, but we know from practice uh, that live subtitles are often asked for advice and assistance, even prior or even during the event. So um, and they're asked about yeah, advice uh, on accessibility in general. So that's why we have included this background information in this module. Then let's move on to unit four, um, which is called Media Accessibility and Access Services, um, which is the final unit of this model module and um, it is slightly bigger in content in comparison to the other units and also consequently uh, regarding learning outcomes. So what should be students be able to do after this unit? They should be able to explain what media accessibility is and how is it has evolved that is going from a narrow to a wide and integrated approach of, of media accessibility. They should also be informed about the current debates on media accessibility and they should be able to explain that and describe these debates. Um, they should also be familiar with current national and international legislation and requirements regarding media accessibility. Uh, so, for example, they should be able to, or they should know, about the EU's Audiovisual Media Services Directive. They should know about the web content accessibility guidelines, but they should also be familiar with the Accessometer on the Media Accessibility website because it is in that website they can find information on legislation in various parts of the world and countries all over the world, um, which can provide them with information. Yeah. Um, let's move to the other slide, which continues the learning outcomes of this unit, the trainee will also be able to enumerate different access services um, according to the user's types, uh, the, the, the user needs, so be it access to visual, auditory or other type of information, or using another typology based on other criteria, for example the distinction between translation and non-translation based services. So they should know that there are more access services than only interlingual life subtitling. Yeah? Um, they should describe the most common of these access services, what the characteristics are. So just to give you an example, they should know about audio description, audio introduction, touch tools, surtitling, audio surtitling, subtitling, surtitling for the, um, um, the deaf and hard of hearing, sign language interpreting, dubbing voice over just to give you the panorama that we offer in the course as well and they should discuss uh, should be able to discuss new approaches to media access training and practice for example the engagement based approach so these were all the learning outcomes i hope i didn't bore you too much um, but 
feel like learning outcomes uh, will be reached by a variety of learning activities. So we will be using reading tasks, like the one you see on the left side of the slide, but also videos, which are in the middle of the slide. And each of these reading tasks and uh, videos are followed by quizzes, just to make sure that the student understands what is being taught in those tasks and they can check whether they have, they have understood correctly. Um, moreover, for those students who want to know more about a specific topic within um, this module, we offer additional reading references so they can follow up, really. Um, just uh, to, to give you an example how these learning activities are structured, um, I will present the structure of um, Unit 1 specifically. And as you can see, we have chunked the information and also the, 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 the teaching activities so that the students can segment their learning processes, uh, but they can also choose what to read and watch first depending on their prior knowledge. Um, so this implies that there is a certain degree of repetition between the various chunks, uh, but we feel that, is, that this actually is a good thing because it fosters knowledge retention. So, so far, uh, the information on module 1A. Um, thank you for your attention, and if any questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Okay, thank you, uh, Iris. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, we have a first question, which is, um, uh, let me see, is 1A maybe missing the cultural aspects? Um, Vesna, what are you referring to in, in terms of cultural aspect? Because I think those cultural aspects also um, are treated in the core components, but are you, are you referring to the cultural aspects in terms of accessibility? Because those are indeed uh, treated in, for example, the reading task, the various approaches to, uh, to disability, to inclusion, etc. Yeah, so I think uh, what you mean by cultural aspects that are indeed touched upon in, in uh, for example, unit one. Okay. Yeah. So then the FFZ principles, yes. Um, Isabel, you might want to, to help me a bit on this. Yes. That was not my, my unit. <laughs> to, to Indeed, um, I, I remember, you know, it's, a, it's a, a few months that we worked on that and we worked with the team and I'm afraid yeah. I, I think I'm, I'm not the one who prepared that particular part. I'm sorry about yeah. that. Uh, I know it's it's about these um, uh, outdoor and indoor, uh, really, yeah. I mean, uh, physical access to uh, buildings. But yeah, I'm afraid, so I, exactly. I don't remember properly. Um, we have another long question in the chat box. Let me see. Uh, okay, so is the overall expectation and design of the courses based on the assumption that the ILSA modules will be taken by users independently and at the end they will be proficient in those topics? Or is the main assumption and design based on the idea that these courses will be implemented in existing BAMA programs and the ILSA materials will be used in blended learning scenarios? Moreover, previously it was mentioned a three to six month average training period needed, so can you please comment which of the two training scenarios, independent online versus blended learning, uh, would apply, uh, would this period apply to? Well, uh, this is obviously a more general question than about 1A. Um, I think when we, we think, and that's why we, we, we focus on the number of Yes, Pablo, would you like to answer that? Yeah, just a second. Thank you for your question, Alina. Um, yeah, so that's a good question, and I guess it goes back to the question of how the ILSA course compares to other courses that are now being developed. Um, for ILSA, I mean, our task was to develop training materials. Um, 
that are publicly publicly available. And that's that's kind of what we had to do, and it's part of um, kind of the uh, ethos of of this sort of projects. Um, what we didn't want to do is just to create a repository. So one, we wanted to include the materials as part of a course that was well designed, um, that has a particular pathway, and that can be taken um, by students if they want to. But it's not monitored. It's not tutored. So there's no. It's not taught basically. So yes, it could be taken by users independently. Um, now, whether at the end of the they will be the proficient or not, it will obviously depend on them. But um, to the extent of which, to which you can be proficient without actually being taught, because the course itself is not taught. So it's more than just a repository, and it's there, and we're guiding with um, you know the teachers' guides and and the way everything's been paced and scaffolded, but it's not being taught. Um, now, a, a great deal of those materials will then be used, I would imagine by different universities and certainly by our universities to teach courses. So for example, in the online Vigo course, we are using uh, quite a lot of that material. The difference is that you are actually being taught uh, day by day, every day, even if it's online, and you get your personalized feedback. And so um, I think our task with the ILSA and our aim with the ILSA course is to provide material that is paced and scaffolded and structured in a way that it can be used independently. But I would imagine that mostly used by trainers to be able to use them in their own courses. Uh, I think I, I'm hoping that this answers your question, Alina. Um, as for the length, well, it, the, the, the material of the youth course is now translating into um, what seems to be an average of four to five, most six month courses by in the different universities of the consortium. Um, so we're looking at one semester, that's mostly what we are, how we're using those materials as part of our MAs typically we haven't done BA yet. Um, again, uh, Alina, if I've not answered your question, then let me know, and I'll. Okay, thank you, Alina. Thank you. Just to that as well. Um, just to add uh, one final note, Catherine, who was asking a question about the Uvigo course and how it kind of reflects on the ILSA materials, saying, uh, I would imagine that it would be difficult to become truly really proficient without the feedback on re-speaking exercise from a talk course. Um, normally, I would, I would, I should think so. I should think you need that kind of feedback. It depends on everyone's background and how proficient you are, for example, in, I don't know, intralingual re-speaking, for example. But I would say feedback is normally needed, yeah. But so, so the ILSA course is kind of, one step to get you there, I would imagine, with all the materials and everything else. Um, and uh, yes, materials will be of free access to answer Maria Jose Garcia Vizcarno's um, question, and they will be available soon. We're just finalizing um, kind of the, the, the last details. Um, and we will, share, we will share a link to the course as well. Sorry, Isabel, I think that's, that's that. Yes, thank you, Pablo. And um, we will, so you have all uh, received that email, so I have all your email address, so as soon as the course is ready, don't worry, we, you will definitely receive the mail with the, uh, with the link to the course and the material, no problem.